Presentation of evidence is some of the most simple and straightforward material on the outline. It's also some of the most important. The National Conference of Bar Examiners tells us that fully one-third of the questions on the MBE, 11 questions, are going to deal with this body of law. Obviously, the best way to become sharp for the MBE is by doing a lot of multi-state questions in practice. This material is relevant for the essays also, not because it's the core of the subject, it really isn't for essay purposes, but because this material really provides the foundation for much of what follows. As we get into the remaining sections in the outline, what we will be focusing on will be relevance, objections, and then figuring out whether or not a given item of evidence is admissible. Here, we're dealing with more basic stuff. We're dealing here with topics such as which party has an obligation to produce evidence and the roles of the judge and the jury. Here, we consider issues such as judicial notice and the scope of examinations. So this material is basic and it isn't terribly complicated. As we consider the contents of this part of the outline, really what we will be thinking about most will be how parties introduce evidence and we'll be considering various burdens of proof and presumptions. One detail that becomes relevant only occasionally within the analysis of evidence essay questions is the distinction between direct and circumstantial evidence. There's a very easy example which is used by prosecutors in courtrooms all over the country during voir dire. Direct evidence would be where we come down the stairs, we the parents come down the stairs early in the morning and catch the kids sitting at the breakfast table eating a big plate of cookies with the open cookie jar behind them. Basically, we've caught them red-handed. We have direct evidence of their theft of the cookies. Whereas, if we come down the same flight of stairs on a different day and we find the kids sitting in the living room covered with crumbs with little smudges of chocolate on their fingers, that's circumstantial evidence. And this is a distinction that you'll see once or twice as you make your way through practice questions, but it really isn't a very big deal. Generally speaking, the issues that arise with regard to the introduction of evidence deal with which party is obligated to present evidence. And here, I think it's useful to take one quick step back to look down at civil litigation. One theme throughout this series of seminars is the idea that civil litigation is sort of a ritual. We have roles that we play, and this acknowledging this fact makes it a lot easier for us to organize our thoughts and to organize essays. So as we think about civil litigation, we know that a plaintiff has to have one or more theories of liability, and the plaintiff will have one or more prayers for relief. The defense is likely to have defenses to the theory of liability and defenses to the relief that the plaintiff is seeking. So as we consider evidence, we have to think up front that the real people that we're concerned about are the plaintiffs here. The plaintiffs, either the civil plaintiff or a prosecutor in criminal court, these people are the ones who basically have the burden. Now, as we will see, often the defense has burdens of their own, and sometimes the burdens between the plaintiff and the defendant are different from one another. A key example of this is in criminal court. Suppose the prosecution is present, they have to prove every element of every charged offense beyond a reasonable doubt, whereas a criminal defendant need only establish an affirmative defense to a preponderance of the evidence, enough to raise a reasonable doubt. So, as we consider the introduction of evidence, it's useful to think about the basic burden being on the plaintiff. If the plaintiff, in a civil case, can't show some evidence to prove every element of the plaintiff's theory of liability, the defense is going to be entitled to a directed verdict on that issue. And similarly, to the extent that a defendant in civil court pleads an affirmative defense and then doesn't have any evidence to back it up, the plaintiff can be entitled to a directed verdict on some issues raised by the defense. So that's the basic structure of how to think about this material. The plaintiff is the one with the obligation, unless there's something very specific about the facts that gives the defense a burden.
As we consider the burden of proof, the big distinction is between a civil and a criminal plaintiff. A civil plaintiff has to establish his or her claim up to a preponderance of the evidence, whereas a criminal prosecutor has to make her case beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, in between these two extremes is a standard of proof called clear and convincing evidence. This is a standard that is typically applied in civil cases that involve quasi-criminal allegations, certain fraud allegations, according to various state court rules, need to be established by something more than a preponderance, but something less than beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, as we consider presumptions, it's useful, again, to acknowledge the key presumption in our system of justice is in the criminal court system, and that's the presumption of innocence. A criminal defendant comes to court presumed innocent, and the prosecution has the sole burden of proof to establish beyond a reasonable doubt each element of each charged offense. Presumptions in civil court are a little bit more subtle. Let me give you an example of a presumption that arises out of the law of wills and trusts in a significant number of jurisdictions across the country. Suppose we've got a situation where a witness to a witnessed will also is a beneficiary under that will. In a number of jurisdictions, that situation gives rise to a presumption of undue influence. In other words, a witness beneficiary wouldn't hold both of those roles unless there was some monkey business going on. Fair enough. It's a presumption of undue influence. But the witness beneficiary is free to present evidence that might overcome that presumption and entitle the witness beneficiary to take under the will. So the reason that we concern ourselves with burdens of proofs and presumptions is because, again, it gives us a framework for figuring out which party has got the burden of production and ultimately, to figure out whether or not an item of evidence should be admissible or not. Another key idea here in the set of issues arising out of presentation of evidence is the mechanics of making objections and the idea of an offer of proof. Ideally, an objection should be raised after a question has been asked and before an answer has been given. But anybody who has spent any time in the real world of courtroom litigation knows that often a witness will answer a question right after a question has been asked or sometimes even before the question has been fully asked. The basic idea is objections have to be timely. If they're not timely, they're waived. Now, what happens when a litigant makes an objection and the judge overrules that objection. At that time, a party that makes the objection should make the offer of proof. And the offer of proof is where the litigant says what he or she th thinks the answer will be to the question and why the judge should admit that item of evidence. And sometimes from the context, it's absolutely clear what the objection is and what the offer of proof would be. But the basic rule is an objection without an offer of proof could be deemed waived on appeal. And an objection that the litigant fails to make at all absolutely is waived on appeal, unless it is so serious an objection that the failure to raise it in court would constitute a Sixth Amendment right to counsel violation. Judicial notice is the next big issue that arises here in the body of law known as presentation of evidence. Judicial notice is really quite straightforward, and although there are lots of highly technical details about it, the basic approach to judicial notice is to consider for yourself whether or not what the judge is doing is reasonable. Basically, there are certain facts that are appropriate for judicial notice, and other facts that are not appropriate. A key example of a fact that is appropriate for judicial notice is what direction a local street runs, whether it's a north-south street or an east-west street. In the locality, everybody basically knows the geography, and it's okay to take judicial notice of local facts that really aren't subject to dispute. Now, interestingly, an item that is a line that is sometimes split on the multi-state is we've got a jury in state A, and 
the court is being asked to take judicial notice of geography in state B. That's not a fact appropriate for judicial notice. So I advise you to go forth and do a lot of practice, and you'll see where some of these hair-splitting details occur. But there are certain circumstances where judicial notice is basically mandatory, and others where it is discretionary. Keep in mind that the court can take judicial notice of state or federal law or international law, and in many cases really has to do so. And realize also a very commonly tested issue with regard to judicial notice, particularly on the multi-state, is that a jury in a civil case must take as true matters that are judicially noticed, whereas a jury in a criminal case need not. One other idea that arises near issues of judicial notice, sometimes in the same context, is where we have a pretrial hearing to deal with the potential admissibility of some items, some item of evidence. Keep in mind that the rules are a lot looser at these evidentiary hearings than they are at trial. And the reason is evidentiary hearings never involve a jury. And here we give the judge a lot of latitude to exercise discretion about whether or not ultimately to admit items of evidence at trial. So a lot of evidence that clearly would be inadmissible at trial, typically hearsay evidence, but other significant evidence that will never come into trial, is admissible for the purposes of determining the admissibility of some other item of evidence outside the presence of the jury. So here we see the issue of judicial notice and the issue of pretrial versus trial admissibility tied together with the issue of jury instructions. Because remember that items of evidence can be admitted for one purpose, but not for some other purpose. And often, a court will issue a jury instruction that reminds the jury of their obligation to interpret a fact in one context, but not in another. A classic example of that, that we will see again more than once in this seminar, is the issue of liability insurance. Suppose we have a situation in which liability insurance ends up coming before the jury in order to show ownership and control. The court would be more or less obligated, certainly if the party asked for it, to issue an instruction that would direct the jury that it could only use that item of evidence, the insurance, to determine ownership and control and not to determine liability. So here, as we consider presentation of evidence, we are really called on to think about the role of the judge, the role of the jury, and how the rules of evidence are used to make that process as efficient and as fair as possible. So keep in mind that in trial, as the evidence is unfolding before the jury, the court maintains control over the process. And one other procedural detail that arises here in the presentation of evidence is the scope of examinations. Keep in mind that the party that calls a witness determines the scope of direct examination. Obviously, it's the direct examination, and the questioner will pick the questions and determine what they will be about. Remember that the opposing counsel may only cross-examine the witness about that particular body of information that was elicited during direct examination. If opposing counsel wants to go into other matters, that opposing counsel will have to call the witness on his or her own behalf. And here we also see that this idea of the scope of examination has an implication with regard to documents. What I've just explained is direct examination will limit opposing, the opposing party's scope of cross-examination. That's not true with regard to documents. If a document is introduced and the proffering party only questions the witness directly about one or two paragraphs, opposing counsel can go over the entire document, even though the direct examination didn't cover all of the document. By introducing the document in direct, it opens the door to the whole document being the subject of cross-examination.
And keep in mind that the judge has the authority to limit the scope of direct and cross-examination, subject to appellate review. Finally, we can consider briefly the form of questions that are asked. Typically, leading questions are not permissible on direct examination, except with regard to preliminary matters or where the witness turns on the questioner and becomes a hostile witness. Leading questions are acceptable on cross-examination or with a hostile witness. And keep in mind that there are some fairly subtle lines that have to be drawn by the judge. Some judges permit questions that others would consider unreasonably argumentative. So, as we consider the role of the judge, we acknowledge that there are two different types of mistakes that a judge can make. A judge can make plain error, which is subject to reversal and perhaps even the ordering of a new trial. And a judge can make other discretionary calls that really don't constitute reversible error. And you'll be called to make some of those judgment calls on evidence essay and multi-state questions. That's it for a consideration of the presentation of evidence. Next, we will consider relevance and reasons for excluding relevant evidence.